Welcome back to That's Some Cheese, part of the Vendetta Sports Podcast Network. Today is Monday, December 14th. We are live here with our NBA guy, our Australian correspondent, Jared Prosser. How are you today? Doing well, Trey. How are you, mate? <laughs> I'm hanging in there. Uh, it's been a while since we did a recording, but for... Uh, September. Yeah. Mm. But f- for any sort of big deep dive on the nba jared's our guy he is our zach lowe of australia so uh (laughs) make sure to follow him it you change your twitter handle all the time i i haven't changed it for a while now you're right i do change it too often but otherwise i would know what it is (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's hey underscore hey underscore it's underscore jp yeah there's no chance i would have (laughs) gotten All right, but anyway, we have a good show for you guys today. We're going to preview the upcoming NBA season. Uh, Otherwise, in a normal year, the NBA would have started already. However, it is starting a couple days before Christmas, I believe, December Mm -hmm. 23rd. So uh, we're about a week away, a little bit more, but we're going to preview the season. We have a good list of topics for you. But I kind of want to start with a holistic view on the NBA has player empowerment gone too far? And I, I sort of wanted to lead off with this because I'd never want to be like pro owner. That feels kind of like I'm, mm. I'm broke, you know, <laughs> why would I want to support yeah. a guy who's who could lose like billions of dollars and still have more money than me. That doesn't feel right. But yeah, <laughs> but does that mean I also have to support what James Harden's doing? Does that also mean I have to support Kyrie Irving not talking to the media? Does that also mean I have to support Anthony Davis two years out being like, I'm not playing for the Pelicans in the middle of a season? Where where does the line get drawn? Yeah, so this is a this is a tough one because if you if you back the owners in, you feel like you're shooting Bambi. You know, you're supporting <laughs> the billionaire over yeah. the millionaire. Um, but I, I think it's important to make a, a like a a demarcation here between what it is and the term player empowerment. It's not player empowerment. It's superstar empowerment. You know, um, Evan Fournier isn't demanding a trade out of Orlando. You know, Brad Wanamaker didn't <laughs> hold Austin over a barrel to get into Golden State. You know, this is all about the superstar. So the term player empowerment is a little bit of a misnomer. We're talking about, at best, maybe three or four percent of the NBA. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. We, we're but it feels it feels worse amount. than it is, though. Well, the thing is, it's those three or four percent that generate probably seventy five percent of the headlines. So, which yeah. is why it feels like it's it's so widespread. But in in reality, it's not. But if if we look at the issue, you know, taking into account that player empowerment is superstar empowerment. I, I am torn. You, know, you, you don't want to go back to the the mid seventies and pre mid seventies when these rich old white guys literally owned the players. Like it, it, you can't go back to that. That was, you know, that, that's a horrible situation to be in. But there is there is a legitimate argument for players pushing whatever freedoms they can get because ultimately the teams can trade you, can cut you on a whim, essentially, if they decide there's a better deal out there. Look at Blake Griffin, you know, the quote-unquote clipper for life, who, you know, that deal lasted, what, four months, five months before he was off? So I I definitely get the players wanting to push for whatever freedoms they can. But the counter-argument is that these players, and remember, it is just the superstar, so we're not talking someone on a minimum here, but these players are getting paid, you know, 20, 25, 30 million dollars per year they're getting enough money to set up their family and their family's families and their great grandkids off one year let alone what they do for the rest of that contract and part of the deal in getting that sort of money is that you you essentially trade your freedom of movement for hundreds of millions of dollars you have a temporary limitation on where you can work so I get the owner's argument as well is that if we're prepared to invest a quarter of a billion dollars in a player, we want some sort of commitment that that player is prepared to invest 
four or five years in us, not two years, and then crack the shits as soon as something doesn't go their way. So it, it is a tough one because players need to take whatever freedoms they can get. I understand that, but you know this is not a, a, a normal situation. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned that you know as you said, I'm broke. I don't have money. How can I side with you? Know, their situation, like whether they get traded or whether the team digs their feet in and says, no, we're not trading. Those players are still going to have more money than you or I will ever see. You know, so <laughs> as much as the billionaires can lose however like, vast sums of money and still swim in their gold vault like Scrooge McDuck, the players are like that light. You know, they, they've still got tens of millions in the bank, plus endorsements, plus this, plus that. So they're not really losing here, the players, if they if they don't get their trade. They're still going to make their money and they still get to play basketball for a living, which, you know, we, we'd all love to do. But Harden individually, if we look at him. Yeah, that's where I wanted yeah. to start. Because yeah. when you look at him, he's a guy that he got Chris Paul. He's like, no, I, I'd rather have Westbrook and, you know, give up all these picks just to make it happen. And then a year later, he's like, well, this didn't really work, so give me John Wall. But also, I want out. But wait, you're the the guy that wanted CP3 out in the first place. You put us in this spot. Yeah, I don't – I I never blame the player for the overpay on the acquisition. Yeah, it's similar – and we'll talk about this later, but Drew Holiday going to the Bucs. You can't blame Giannis wanting Drew Holiday on the Bucs overpaying. Um, this is simply the. Do we the know that Giannis wanted him though? You would imagine, given the situation, <laughs> that if he, yeah, if the, if the team said, "Hey, we can get Drew Holiday," and Giannis said, "No, he's terrible. I don't like him. He's not the right player. He looked at me wrong one day." They wouldn't have went and got Drew Holiday. Or yeah, was he like, "Well, he's better than Bledsoe." Well, yeah, <laughs> basically, but it, it's it's essentially becomes when something like that happens, it becomes a buyer's market, and you know, Griffin knew that with Bledsoe, um, Presty knew it with uh, with the CP3 Westbrook trade. Um, so I, I don't necessarily blame the price for getting that player on the superstar in his case, Harden, but the fact that he couldn't make it work with Westbrook, with Chris Paul with Dwight Howard, that is all on Harden. Um, he doesn't get along with anybody. No, he, he's clearly a, a, a very idiosyncratic person and a difficult teammate to play with. You know, he, he's become a you know, he, he's become very accustomed to a certain type of basketball and it's a different style of basketball than you know that he's played nowhere else within the league. But going back to his um, behavior i suppose around these last few weeks yeah in a normal situation if he is flouncing about in clubs in atlanta and vegas and you know doing a little mini holdout and you know, it'd be unsavory it's insulting to the fans to the team all that sort of thing but ultimately it's it's fairly harmless but we're not in a normal circumstance we're in a covid circumstance now, him wandering around no mask rubbing his face in bosoms and whatever he's doing mm-hmm. You know, and then coming into the team, it's still disrespectful to the team and his teammates and, and the coaches and, and the fans, but it's also really bloody dangerous. Like, you know, you and I are in very different situations on, on other sides of the world. Now, you've got more COVID cases in the States than anywhere else in the world. We're up in arms in Victoria, down in the south part of Australia, because we've got seven cases. And they're all international returnees who are in hotel quarantine. We've got literally no community cases. So, you know, if I can sit there and understand that it's dangerous, surely James Harden could. Surely. We need to Photoshop your face when it went like this. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, like, he just, and look, I, I'm, I've been a, a big fan of Harden's for a long time. My eldest son is a rocket's tragic based on Harden. When does the line go too far, though? Because what he's doing is, you know... Well, outside of the COVID circumstance stuff, because that that, that does differentiate this case from anything else, but just on the the player empowerment bit, um, I I guess 
I guess we'll see what he plays like. Because if he comes in and half asses it, that's where it goes too far for me. Because you're still earning all of your pay for, you know, 60 He's earning more than anybody, basically, because he's on those super max deals. Oh, yeah. But whatever your contract is, you, sh- you should be putting, you know, 100% of your effort in. There should be professional pride. So if he comes in and he balls out and he you know, does what he did early last season where he had that string of 30-plus games or 40-plus games, whatever it was, if he comes in and plays like that, then, okay, he's he's had a sook, he's had a bitch and a moan, but he's come in and he's playing hard. I'm cool with that. If he comes in and basically torpedoes the team from within, that's where I have a problem. You know, it, it, it's similar to what Anthony da- – you mentioned Davis. Anthony Davis did that to the Pelicans a few – a few years ago before he yeah, went to Yeah, that's where I have a problem. Yeah, you know, if somebody demands a trade and they still sit there and go, but I respect my coaches and my teammates and I'm gonna play hard because I'm a professional, that's fine. You've let your team know that you want out, but you're still gonna do your job. I'm cool with that. But when you start torpedoing the team from the inside, that's when I have an issue. What are your thoughts on uh Harden, I believe it was reported he turned down a $50 million per year contract. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you know, you and I would sit there and, and go, Christ almighty, how stupid is he? <laughs> but he's already got, you know, hundreds yeah. of millions of earnings. So this is what I'm talking about before with the billionaire millionaire thing. You don't want to side with the billionaires, but the millionaires are doing okay. So he's in the situation where he can afford to turn down $50 million a year. I, isn't it funny? Those. I remember a scene in uh, Last Dance where Jerry Reinsdorf is like, "Yeah, we don't really want to extend Horace Grant. We'll save a couple million." <laughs> <laughs> but remember back then, um, yeah, Jordan. Isn't it signed crazy how much it's million. changed though? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, Jordan signed for thirty million one year, which was more than the salary cap. <laughs> oh, sorry, I think it was thirty-three million he signed for in ninety. I want to say ninety-seven or ninety-eight. And that was more than the actual salary cap. The salary cap was like 30.7 million or something like that. And it, it's obscene how much money is in the game now. It was obscene 30 years ago, frankly. But, you know, we're talking as laymen here, not as multi millionaire basketball stars. But on Harden, you know, let's, let's assume um, that, you know, that he turns up, he decides to play, all that sort of thing. A, do you think he's going to be moved? And, and, you know, as you know, I wrote a piece about this last week looking at trade possibilities with uh, the four teams he's he's publicly put out there that he wants to go to in Brooklyn, Philly, Milwaukee, Miami. Do you think he moves? Personally, I think I don't think he moves before the start of the season at least. I would say no. Oh, hey, no. Mm. I, don't know, I don't know why, but it, it just doesn't feel like there's a trade that like if you're Houston, don't you want to guarantee that you're getting a star back? The yep. the Brooklyn trade, okay, Lavert's a nice player. Okay, Dinwiddie's a nice player. Okay, maybe Jared Allen's a nice player. None of those guys are okay. Here's your max contract. I don't have to worry about it. Like no, when no. Lavert comes up, what's Lavert gonna want? And are you gonna want to pay Lavert what he wants? That's well, the problem. Well, Levert is one of these players, if he goes to Houston, he will become the main guy and he will get max money or close to max money by default. Is that what you want, though? <laughs> oh, as a Houston fan? God, no. You wouldn't yeah. want to be paying him more than... Uh, I mean, you, you, even at the top end of Levert, you'd probably look at maybe 20. That's what I'm, And he would get more. Yeah, he, he would definitely get more if he went to Houston. Now, I'm with you. I don't think he gets moved until, at the very least, the trade deadline. But my tip is he won't get moved until next offseason, if at all. Like, and even even the uh, the Philadelphia deal, do you really want Ben Simmons straight up or with a few more pieces? Are we 100% sold that Ben Simmons can lead us to a championship? Even at, We just uh, traded for John Wall, so how, that doesn't really work either. So, yeah, the wall trade doesn't fit with Simmons, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure the wall trade fits with Harden either. No. <laughs> um, if you need to get rid of Harden, Philly has the best deal. You know, Simmons and whatever salary Philly you need, that's that's the deal. Yeah, you know, I, I think in the one I I published, I think it was Shake Milton and some scrub that I can't even remember now. <laughs> but 
yeah, he, Simmons would be the best trade haul out of those four. And yeah, there might be some suitor out of the blue that we don't see, but out of the four that he has said he would go to, Simmons is definitely the best haul. The best situation for him, I think, would be Milwaukee in a trade for Middleton and whatever pieces. Um, Giannis is the the centerpiece of that team, so he takes a lot of the pressure off Harden of being the be-all and end-all. They've also got the defensive pieces to cover him, especially with with Holiday on board. But the one thing they miss is an offensive fulcrum. Middleton's good. Middleton is really good, but he is not quite capable of taking over a game in a conference final situation. And Giannis, if you close off the key, he's kind of stuffed. James Harden is a skeleton key on offense. He, he would be the guy who could put Milwaukee over the top if they were really serious about um, going for a championship right now. The, the most interesting one to me is the Miami Heat. Because Pat Riley's always been aggressive. He always wants the stars. I obviously Tyler hero and Duncan Robinson and all that. That's not enough, but from a Miami perspective, would you rather just go get Harden instead of we're going to dip our toes in the 2021 class and see what happens. If you could get Harden, yes, but what would they give up? That's what I'm saying. You said it yourself, you know, Tyler hero had a really nice playoff run, but that's one playoff run as a rookie in a, in the most unusual playoff situation we'll probably ever see. You know, I'm, I think he's going to be good, but I wouldn't put my house on it just yet. Um, yeah, I, 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 if there's anybody who can pull a rabbit out of a hat, it's Pat Riley. I just don't see how he could get that deal across the line <laughs> without giving up Bam or Butler, which he surely wouldn't do. Hopefully he wouldn't. I think they're missing a couple picks too. Yeah, well, they're um, they're definitely out. I think they're still out one more from Dragic, aren't they? <laughs> That's weird. But back in you know 1972 when they traded for him. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, yeah I don't I, think I, he gets traded might, though. Well, the last pick might happen. have been this year for Dragic, but uh, it might. Yeah, I have a feeling there's still one more owing on that, which is yeah, crazy. <laughs> Um, yeah, look, I, I honestly think he stays. I think he stays for probably the whole season. In Houston. Let's move into the uh, overall off-season talk, but first, a uh, quick word from one of our sponsors. Hey, you. Yeah, you. In case you hadn't heard, your favorite renegade sports media group has its own Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash vendetta sports media to support our efforts to continuously bring you sports, gaming, and other media coverage as only we can. We've got four different membership tiers. For $3 a month, we'll give you a simple thank you on our Patreon site. For $6 a month, you get a thank you, and you get to become a recruit in Jackson Law's Vendetta University Gaming Series. For $10 a month, you get everything from the previous tiers, a special thank you at the end of our videos, free access to our upcoming Discord chat, and a free koozie after four months. And then the big dog, $50 a month, gets you everything from the previous tiers, as well as opportunities for Fantasy League invites, stream gaming, possible invites to mock NFL and NBA draft sessions, a once a month Google Hangout, and after four months, a free t-shirt. Yeah! Go to patreon.com forward slash vendetta sports media and help us to improve our pledge to bring you the best sports, gaming, and other media coverage. The following broadcast is brought to you in association by Forever Grips. Go to forevergripsgaming.com for all of your affordable gaming accessories. Need new grips for your analog sticks? They've got it. Need to swag up your controller or console, including the Xbox Series X or PS5? They've got it. Need a sweet mouse pad to complete your setup? Go to forevergripsgaming.com now. Act now and use the Vendetta Sports Media promo code VSM15 at checkout to get 15% off of your purchase. That's right, 15% off by using our promo code VSM15. Forever Grips, the best accessories for the best prices are with Forever Grips. All right, Jared, we're back. Uh, make sure to follow Jared on Twitter. Hey, underscore, hey. Hey, underscore, hey, underscore. It's yeah. underscore JP. 
Make sure to give Jared a follow. Check out our site, vendettasportsmedia.com. Subscribe on YouTube if you haven't done so already. All right. Overall winner. I don't know. Maybe give me two. Two winners. Yeah, there's there's a few that I could refer to. And one thing with the winners is you, you've got to take into account the goals of those teams. Yeah, I, I see, and look, we're guilty of it as well here at Vendetta, but we look at the winners of the off-season as the ones who have put themselves the closest to championship contention or given them, risen themselves up <clears throat> the most levels uh, amongst the tiers of teams. So in that sense, the Lakers and Clippers are absolutely the winners. The Lakers are dealing from the position of ultimate strength and they've improved on those strengths. Um, the Clippers had some severe structural issues, particularly at centre, and in getting search of Barker, they've pretty much fixed them. Um, they had a coach that was perhaps getting a bit stale and they brought in a new championship winning voice. Um, Atlanta and Portland got a lot of, particularly off Dakota with Portland, they got a lot of buzz because they've moved themselves from, you know, lower playoff to potentially quasi contention in Portland's case, or from the outside to the inside of the playoffs in Atlanta's case. But you've also got to consider something like, and, and this is going to be a bit of a controversial one, I would count Charlotte as a winner of this offseason. They don't have any grand goals of trying to get into the top four of the East or anything like that. They just want a marquee name. That's all they wanted. They, they just want names that people recognise that can go, so that people can go, oh, yeah, Charlotte, they exist. They're an actual team. And they've had the guy they wanted in ball fall to them at three. And they, like, of course, it's a massive overpay, but they got Gordon Hayward, who, you know, you can't take, no, no leg injury is going to take away the fact that he's an all-star. And if he wasn't injured, he probably would have gotten two or three more all-star appearances in Boston. So even a team like Charlotte have had a, a winning off season as such. It's just that their version of a win is different to what the Lakers are. I'm going to push back on some of the teams you listed as winners, just because I think it'll be more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> fight, 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 fight. <laughs> I'm worried about the Clippers. Mm. And maybe this is dumb. Maybe this is a terrible way to look at it. But I think energy is a big problem on that team. Kawhi Leonard's not very outspoken, and Paul George obviously isn't a leader. They don't have any sort of alphas in the room. They don't have any guys that, hey, we're down five. Can we get something going here? I thought Harrell was a guy that, I mean, say what you want, he's not perfect. But that guy cares. That guy's a dog. That guy, mm. he whips his hair around. He gets things going a little bit off the bench. He can spark things. I think that's a big loss in more ways than one. Har Montrez Harrell, though, it's it's been pretty widely reported that he and Paul George could not stand the sight of each other. So when when you've got an imperfect player who is not getting along with your second best player, your you know your second max guy, and you can replace him with a guy who like Sergi Barker who clearly gets along with Kawhi. The two of them got along famously for that season in Toronto. And Ibaka, he's not a a rah-rah, fire and brimstone type of leader, but he is a very stoic individual who, you know, in Toronto, they recognise him as one of the leaders of the locker room. Not necessarily getting out there and, you know, yelling at the crowd and fist pumping and whatever, but within the locker room, and you know, that's often where a lot of these relationships are, are made or can be made or broken. Ibaka is, um, it's an overused term, but he's an excellent locker room lawyer. He's a chemistry guy. I'm still worried about him, though, because I don't think their biggest problem has been solved. And I wrote this before the start of the playoffs. And it just felt like I thought the, the Clippers were the favorite, but mm. they had this fatal flaw of they have a lot of guys that don't really move the ball. There's not yeah. really a real ball distributor there, and Lou Williams is he's almost kind of a problem with how bad he is on the defensive end too. Well, this is where I think getting rid of um, Trez has allowed them to – because Trez and Lou Williams, they have this like telepathic understanding in the pick and roll. To play one, you kind of have to play the other. So with Trez going and bringing in Ibaka, it's allowed them to 
bring in a guy like Canard, who I think will take a lot of those Lou Williams. Which is what I was going to say. He's almost like dangerously important. Yeah. Like like if he gets hurt for the year, it it feels like a bigger loss than it should. Yeah. And and look, Canard's no great shakes on defense, but I mean, you and I are better than Lou Williams right now on defense. So (laughs) it's, you know, Canard can, he's more consistent on offense, I suppose. He's not quite as dynamic, but he will fit into the team ethos. And he is a much, much better team defender than, than Lou is. Um, I still feel like they need more ball distributors. It felt like the offense got so stagnant last year sometimes. Yeah, they don't have a... Especially Marcus a Morris. The ball goes to Marcus Morris. You're not seeing it again. Oh, God, no. No, <laughs> he is the biggest black hole. Um, you know, it's, it is an issue. Um, even with... just the thing with... Um, like, Kawhi's your best player. You want the ball in his hands. But in Toronto, they still had Kyle Lowry, who is a genuine floor general. They don't they have that guy. Gifted... No, they don't. And they don't have a, a genuine uh, playmaking big like Marcus Gasol either. And going back to his days in San Antonio, you know, for the first part of his career, he was a support guy. But even when he became the star, there was still that fabled San Antonio ball movement. You know, for most of his time there, if not all of it, I think, you still had Manu and Tony. So you still had guy, and you you know you had your bench guys like Patty Mills and um, uh, what's the Italian shooter? Um, Bellinelli. Bellinelli, yeah, you still had Bellinelli. All these guys who had Spurs DNA, so to speak. So, and of course you had the cult of Popovich. So you had all this stuff that kind of kept Kawhi um, within the team setting, you know, until he his calf went and he broke himself out of the of the, of the the whole Spurs setup, but that is a concern. Um, but you remember the uh, the Cavs teams of Ty Lu. They couldn't play defense, but they had record-setting offenses. If do you remember the? Um, I can't remember what series it was, but there was the one that the Warriors won four one, and the one game that the Cavs won, they scored something like eighty nine points or eighty five points in a half. I can't remember what that was, but it was, a, it was a game, I believe it was a game four, and they were down three zip, and they came out and just absolutely scorched. But that's what those teams could do. Ty Lu, yes, he had LeBron James and Kevin Love and all these guys, but he, he was there, uh, right? Yeah. Probably. I think he was still there. Um, but he he is able to to get a really good offense going without having a genuine ball distributor because for all of Kyrie's dazzling ball handling, he's not an old fashioned floor general. He's not looking to set up his teammates. Um, even LeBron who led that team in assists is a scorer at heart. You know, he's someone who'll go and get you 30, 35 in a playoff game. So I, I have a little bit more faith. I think overall Doc Rivers is a better coach than Lou, but for that offense, I have a little bit more faith in Lou. And, we have to talk about Charlotte. <laughs> they can't be a winner. They can't be a winner. Here's my, here's like my I thing. Said. It's, it's one thing to pay for Hayward, and I actually do like Hayward. I would have had no problem. I mean, yes, it's a lot of money, but I would have had no problem giving it to him. You can't cut Batum to do it. <laughs> you can't eat $9 million a year for the next three or f- whatever, four years just to get Hayward like that that's a tough pill to swallow oh look it's not it's not a well-managed team let's face it but like I said they are a winner relative to their goal their goal was to get marquee names and they've got one in the draft they got the guy they wanted in the draft are we sure he's good I'm not and (laughs) I watched him live you know he I, I literally you know the stadium where I actually commentate basketball commentate live games I watched him at that stadium and I'm not sure he's good. I think he will be, well, when we say good, you know, I don't think he'll be an all-star, put it that way. But he has name recognition and so does Gordon Hayward. And that's what Charlotte are after. They're essentially trying to not be Orlando, who, you know, nobody outside of Orlando cares about. They want to they want to get a little bit of, and if you'll excuse the pun, they want to get some buzz about the side. And they've done that. Yeah, and it's not going to make them a sixth seed or anything or anything like that, but 
it's it's done what they wanted to do, which is to generate some some excitement about the the team. So isn't it funny? <laughs> all the years that Michael Jordan made fun of Jerry Krause, now he can't do his now he can't do the job that Krause was doing all those years winning titles. Well, if, if there's one thing that the last the last dance showed, I keep watching that, it. I'm addicted to it. Oh man, I'm so on the good. I'm on the fourth time through. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, I wish I had that sort of time. Um, no, one thing that 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 doco did show is that Kraus was good at his job. He was genuinely good at his job. And yeah, it, like I know MJ is not the the GM, but he has a lot of sway as the owner he's a very hands-on owner and it's not always the best hands you know it's like they say the best players don't often make the best coaches and yeah he's another one who who just doesn't quite understand how to build a team um i can't get over what the lakers did though sorry i can't get over the lakers it just seems like an unfair game how's it how's this fair (laughs) they win a title lakers exceptionalism yeah, you know, they always get their way eventually. That's, that's why, I, like, I was kind of happy those last few years just seeing the Lakers get to see how the other Same. half looks. Same. But, it ju- it just sucks because this is a team. They've had all the. They've been terrible. They've had all these picks, and not only have they've had these picks, but the guys they've picked haven't worked. D'Angelo yeah. Russell shipped out of town. Julius Randle not quite good enough. Brandon Ingram didn't really thrive there. Lonzo Ball shipped out of town didn't really thrive all the guys they picked while they were terrible didn't work out and they're still this good doesn't feel right that's what happens when lebron comes to town man <laughs> it <sucks. laughs> he's, he's the band-aid. it does it does and look we're gonna get some hate mail from lakers fans for this but you know screw it but if orlando lakers drafted the guys that the lakers did they would still stink mm. yep <laughs> you, you're dead right it's um, yeah. It, it's it's frustrating to see that uh, you see so many well-run franchises can't quite catch a break, and you see a team that was just run horridly for essentially that's an understatement uh, seven or eight years really, and they just get you know a, a man who who has an argument at being the best player of all time fall into their laps. It's, yeah, doesn't feel, yeah. Could, especially the Schroeder whole... trade. The Schroeder trade drives me insane. In, in a terrible draft, you're telling me Oklahoma City, Sam Presti, you couldn't have done better than that? What was it, well, pick 27, pick 28 is what they got? Yeah, look, I'm not sure that Schroeder is – I'm not sure he's universally um, rated around the league. He had, he had a really good year last year. I think I picked him as my sixth man of the year. He won the award, didn't he? No, no, he finished second. Who won it? Harold. Uh. And then- again. Yeah, again. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm not sure he's... Because let's face it, he's an undersized point guard who doesn't really distribute. You know, he's a scoring point guard who isn't a great shot. Uh, there is a whole lot of regression potential in Dennis Schroeder this year he had a career year but he feels year. better than Rondo oh he he is better than Rondo yeah, so. in the regular season I don't know if he's better than playoff Rondo though like <laughs> you don't get you don't you don't sign Rajon Rondo for 72 games or 82 games you sign him for 16 yeah that's all you do you, you just put him in mothballs until April. yeah that which is the um, craziest part because are, are we sure the Hawks are good are we sure the Hawks are no. going to get their money's worth? No, we're, we're really not. We're, we're definitely not. Because that team um, was horrible. Oh yeah, yeah. That was a like that was almost Wizards level defense, and they had no offense outside of of Trey Young and the occasional John Collins burst. I'm but, not sure they fixed their defense. Well, I mean, no, Chris, no. Chris Dunn is nice, but the other guys that they brought in aren't really defensive wizards either. Chris Dunn is an, an outstanding defensive player, but Capella's overrated as a defender, frankly. Um, and the rest of the guys, look, they, they'd be looking for growth from, you know, Reddish and Hunter and all these guys who can potentially be good defenders. But it's year two, you know, and, and they had they struggled in year one. They haven't played since what March. It's probably unfair to ask those guys to suddenly be 
acceptable league average defenders at this stage. Maybe year three would be right for that. But are we sure they're better than the Wizards? And I'm not. I'm not even a Westbrook fan. No, you're definitely not a Westbrook fan. But I'm not um, sure they're better than the Wizards. Yeah, look, neither am I. Because uh, the Wizards will get better. Yeah, people are saying, well, it's Westbrook for John Wall. It's not. It's Westbrook for nothing. And he before, didn't play like, like two years. Exactly. And people, you know, in, in the bubble, Westbrook had the calf injury. He was under-conditioned. He'd come off COVID. Yeah, he, he was a shell of himself. But people forget in, was it January and February, he averaged like 38 and 8. He, he's literally an all-NBA player last season. So, what, so Washington have, have traded nothing for a guy who was third-team all-NBA last season. That is a massive upgrade. I kind of like uh, NBA playing in the West. He's coming to the East. You know, if Thomas Bryant can continue to hit threes the way he did in the bubble, you know, and you know, that's sort of a tease to something we'll talk about later. But if he can continue to hit threes, you know, Davis Bertange, you know, as soon as he steps into the gym, he's in range. If Hachimura, I kind of like Hachimama. Hachimama is pretty good. <laughs> I I'm, I'm a big Rui fan. I love it. Um, but if, if him or Avdia can consistently knock down threes, you throw in Beal, Westbrook could drive a truck down the lane. I think they might be I think they might be better than the Hawks. I think we need I to don't chill out that. on the Hawks. I don't doubt that. I mean they'll give up 125 a game, the Wizards. Yeah. But there's every chance they'll score 130 on you. I think I think the Hawks are gonna give up 125 too though. Oh yeah. <laughs> they've got uh, more defensive potential, but I think they've there is there's a lot left to prove left to prove with Atlanta. I, I want to see it before we proclaim them as playoff certainties. Let's go over some winners or I'm sorry, some losers, but let's take another break for one of our sponsors. The following broadcast is brought to you in association by XP Coffee Company. XP Coffee Company is the fresh brewed coffee made for gamers by gamers. Get amazing flavors like Choco Loco in 8, 12, or 16 ounce bags or level up and get illusion, isolation, nightmare, or the majestic throne blends in light, medium, or dark roast in whole bean, coarse French press, drip, or fine espresso in 12 ounce, 16 ounce, or two pound bags. Wow! Shipping worldwide. If you're in the U.S., go to usa.xpcoffee.co. If you're in Europe or in the U.K., Go to www.xpcoffee.co. XP Coffee Company for gamers by gamers. All right, we're back. Jared Prosser here again. We're going over the NBA season preview. Make sure to check out him. He's done a couple of great articles. Um, did one on Harden destinations. Has done some overall ones on draft stuff with the Eastern Western Conference, off-season stuff, Eastern Western Conference. Make sure to read his stuff. But uh, some losers. I don't know, two, three. What do you got? Yeah, there's two that stuck out for me. I'll cover off one of them quickly, and that's Detroit. Um, after the draft, I thought Detroit were going to have a great off-season. I really, really liked their draft. Um, Stewart's good. I love Sadiq Bay, And as you know, I had Killian Hayes ranked in the top three of my personal draft board. I think they drafted superbly. And then they went and screwed it all up in free agency by dra by basically signing every big man they could possibly get for too much money. Um, you know, one of the worst individual acquisitions of this offseason is is Jeremy Grant. It's and it's nothing against Jeremy Grant. He's a he's a good solid player. But to pay him twenty million to expect him to be one of the leaders, two-way leaders of your team, and to have him do it as a small forward, that's just a recipe for disaster. You know, his first two games of the preseason, something like one for 11 and two for eight or two for nine, he shot. And that's completely to be expected. The guy is tailor-made for the Denver Nuggets. He can defend all these guys that Jokic can't or that Harris can't or that Barton can't or that Porter Jr. can't, and he's the perfect garbage player to thrive off the, the the gravity that Jamal Murray creates or to cut to the lane and just feed off those slick Jokic passes. Yeah, I, I wasn't even going to... 
I wasn't even going to bring up the Pistons because I think they're so irrelevant. <laughs> we, we have we have an inside joke with uh in the Slack because Alex said, you know, Detroit could land some max free agents or whatever. So I bust on them because that'll never happen. <laughs> well, <laughs> if Charlotte can get Hayward. I, let, <laughs> let's talk about because I want to talk about two things here. Yeah. Everybody, it seems I never watched a guy, so I'm staying out of this one. But it seems like everybody else on this site hates Killian Hayes. So I want to ask you why you like him because I'm not going to pretend to know. I don't watch French games. Like when, <laughs> oh, when it comes he to the international, in Germany for one. Yeah, he when it comes to Germany for one. So there you go. When I it comes play. to the international guys, I'll see him in the NBA, no. and we'll see how it goes. I'm not going to pretend yeah. to know because I'm not watching those games. Yeah. And I don't With even know I, when they're on or how I can even watch. <laughs> I, I I look at I look at Hayes and I think he could be what Brogdon was to the Pacers last year. Um, you know, very but and that that just the fact that I had that sort of player, yeah, you know, a Malcolm Brogdon facsimile in the top three shows the weakness of this draft, by the way. Um, but he's he's a, a good shot who can get better. He's got an excellent feel for the game. He's his ability to create an angle for a pass is outstanding. He's um, he's inconsistent. He's still a kid. He's inconsistent. He's got really good size. He's got enough speed. I he's not a superb athlete, much like Brogdon. You know, he slipped into the second round despite being uh, well, he was all American, wasn't he, Malcolm Brogdon, as a collegiate? Yeah, yeah, I think he was. yeah I'm pretty sure he was. But yeah, you know, that was where the surprise was that he slipped into the second round. I think Hayes has got a similar sort of athleticism to Brogdon where he's going to be crafty rather than explosive. The one thing that he needs to do is to show that his right hand is there for anything more than ballast. He never uses it. If he can, and you know, it's the NBA, they'll develop a right hand. And I think once that happens, once he can go left and right, his jumper looks good. Um, it, he, it will get better. The percentages will get better. Um, no, I, I think... And, and defensively, because of his size and his smarts, again, he, he'll have trouble staying in front of your De'Aaron Fox, Kyrie Irving types. But he's the sort of guy that can probably switch onto small forwards if you need him to. He's big and he's you know, big for a point guard. He's strong. He's clever. And he's got good technique defensively. I, I don't think he'll be a superstar. He's the sort of guy that might max out with a couple of all-star games. But in this draft, that's good. I'm with you on the Jerry oh, yeah. thing. On a previous show with Jackson, we were kind of going over some off-season stuff. And I brought up the fact that some of these players are out of their minds. Like, <laughs> like if you're Hayward, let's just say you're Hayward. And I, money aside, you'd rather be the number one in Charlotte than to play on this Boston team with your college head coach? It just seems odd to me. Yeah, <laughs> J- Jeremy oh. Grant. You'd rather be like a better option in Detroit than to be on this great Nuggets team. And I get maybe you want to be used more, but maybe you shouldn't be used more. Oh, Jeremy Grant shouldn't be. With Hayward, <laughs> with Hayward, it's unusual. I mean, I, I understand if he went home to Indiana. That that I would get. I got that. And, one too. I, know, yeah. and I know that Charlotte have shown an interest in him before. If you remember when Utah let him go to market as a restricted they were free the agent, sheet signed team. the offer sheet. Yeah. So Hayward, look, it might be a money play with him. He has been on a, a max contract before, of course, the, with the Charlotte offer sheet. But I don't know, maybe it's a maybe he's always wanted to go there. That's why he signed the sheet in the first place. He's always been impressed by something there, whatever it is. I, I don't know. With Jeremy Grant, it is very likely a money play. He will never ever get the chance to earn twenty million dollars a season. But it, it was reported that the Nuggets offered him the same deal, and he chose Detroit. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. No, in that case, that's insane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he He's on the Western Conference finalist, and fair enough, it might have been a bit of a fluky run, but he's on a quasi-contender in the in a role that is made in the laboratory for a player like, like Jeremy Grant. Great. He wants to spread his wings. That's superb. But ultimately, for Detroit to get good, like if Detroit get to being a 45 to 50 win team, Jeremy Grant on that sort of team is what he was with the Nuggets. Yeah, Sadiq Bay no. needs to be putting up 18 a game. Killian Hayes needs to be a 17 and 7 guy. Isaiah Stewart needs to stick. They need a 
a free agent to come in, and Jeremy Grant is the fifth starter. And I'm not sure he's worth fifteen million a year. For his defense, I would probably say like that'd be reasonable, the very top end of reasonable. <laughs> but you know, I, I could I could understand you, you know you, you could defend fifteen million a year. You could defend forty five over three years. It's very hard to defend sixty over three. Yeah. Uh, what else you got? Um, well, we, we've, we've sort of... No, that's... Well, actually, no, there is one. And this one is a bit of a contingent one. It's the Bucks. Now, I'm with they, you. Uh, they flew out of the gate. You know, getting... Yes, it was an overpay, but getting Drew Holiday to replace Bledsoe and the, the Bogdan Bogdanovich sign and trade, you just looked at it and thought, wow, Milwaukee are getting shit done and they're getting it done early. But, of course, that debacle could have catastrophic consequences for the whole franchise. The Bucks are old. You, know, you look at their you look at their list. Giannis is what 25, 26. Middleton's 28, 29. DiVincenzo's young. Every other contributor is I love how he's the third name you brought up. <laughs> but but the reason I bring him up is they're the only three rotation players from last season who are under 30. Every other player on that team is old genuinely get getting old they're right at the end of their prime or past their prime yeah they've gotten rid of a few of those corver has gone matthew's gone bledsoe's gone but they are still an old side and part of the um part of the dilemma with Giannis is that they've put together a side that can win now and as that side ages out Giannis is still not in his prime you know his typical prime years would be 26 to 32 he's only entering it now so Giannis needs to have full confidence that the front office, the ownership group, can rejig that team, can rebuild it around him so that he can compete through his very best years. And seeing them overpay for Holiday and then seeing the absolute shit show that was that sign and trade for Bogdanovich, now that's surely got to leave some doubts in his mind. I'm with you. This is this is my number one loser team of the entire offseason. Hmm. Because to me, it was uh, – I'm not giving that up for holiday. But I love the Bogdanovich pick. The, yeah. the, the, the Bogdanovich fit seemed perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. Ideal for them. Perfect. Like, th- that was – okay, I'm terrified of the Bucs. The Celtics aren't beating that Bucs team. No. With Bogdanovich. With Bogdanovich, yeah. they're not beating that Bucks team. Now, yeah. they just gave up three first-round picks for Holiday and two pick swaps for Holiday. It, there's so many things to this. Are we sure that Holiday's going to stay? Like, what? what? Well, that's the thing. It, it's definitely <laughs> a play for this season, isn't it? Um, now, I mentioned this as a contingent loser. If Giannis resigns, whether that's before the deadline for this season or at the end of next season. I think season, he's got eight eight days. Yeah, but remember, he can sign it at the end of this season. So it's not necessarily yeah. he, you know, we get nine days, he hasn't signed it, the world's going to end. Now, he can sign it at the end of next season. But if he signs, whether it's this week or in a year's time, then all of this, everything we've spoken about, everything has been written everywhere on the interwebs, becomes a footnote. Nothing more than a footnote because Giannis stayed. However, if he leaves, this becomes a flashpoint. This becomes the thing. You know, who was the last great player to leave the Bucks before they hit their prime? Kareem, 1975. I was going to say that. And people still talk about it. In 45 years, people could be talking about Giannis leaving the Bucks. I was going to say, this reminds me of uh, Orlando and Shaq. What was it? He got offended that they didn't offer him enough money and they just kind of ruined it. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a little bit more contemporary than me mentioning Kareem in the seventies, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, with with Giannis, this could be we fucked up the Bogdanovich thing. It made him leave. Like, yeah, isn't that crazy? And, and that's what, <laughs> but that's what I mean. This this is either a footnote if he resigns, or or it's the flashpoint. It's the it's the turning point where Giannis said, "No, I'm out." So the, they'll, so they'll this, never get a guy like that again. Well, especially not with the fifteenth pick. I mean. My God, yeah, it's, it's a it's that happens a once every a hundred years. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's it's completely, you know, every team's tried tried to do it at some point. You know, we've got the Bruno Caboclo's of the world to prove that, 
But Giannis is a is a one in a million, you know, mid first round pick. That's that's the one in a million result. Um, but yeah, look, in a year's time, we could, you know, or even in a week's time, the Bucks might not be the loser of this off season because if Giannis resigns, fine. Even more than a championship this season, Giannis resigning is probably their top priority because that means they can compete for another five years. Yeah, even if they don't win it this year, they've got him. They can rebuild knowing that they've got some certainty. But if he doesn't, God Almighty, you know, the, the folks up in and I wouldn't blame him. Waste of the ground. I wouldn't blame him for leaving. Yep. Yeah, I, I got to admit it concerns me. The um, the fact that they've screwed it up so royally and so publicly, it's yeah, it's really got to concern Giannis about whether this 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 mob, this these people that are running that team can rebuild again, so that he's competing. Yeah, you know, for a championship at 30, 31, 32. I want to talk like maybe two minutes on my Homer Celtics. T- <laughs> because, <laughs> yep. because immediately after, you know, the free agency wave, I kind of wanted to jump off a ledge. I, I did, I didn't you feel were, good you were that much in on Wanamaker? None. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, I was so disappointed that they lost Hayward for nothing. And I, I didn't even really want Miles Turner. But – it just felt like you can't lose Hayward and get better. And I know there's a chance that Tatum and Brown continue to get better, and that's really their hope. Mm. But this is an off season where I really felt like, okay, Tatum's not a baby anymore. Like, he can be a top 5, 10-ish player in the league. Okay, Brown's not a baby anymore. Like, it just felt like in the playoffs – they would have great performances, but they weren't quite ready for prime time yet. They they just needed that little extra seasoning. I felt like this could have been the year where everything was going to come together. And then Hayward walks out the door. And then all we really get is Tristan Thompson. And here come the Kardashians. And now Kemba's knees are bad. And <laughs> gotta, Jeff Teague's going to end up playing major minutes. I just... I don't feel good anymore. <laughs> the Thompson signing is genuinely good. Like, I know. He, he, was, <laughs> he has a good signing. But, you know, you had a luxury in with Hayward being your fourth, fifth option. I know. Uh, but it's And it's not just Hayward leaving. It's also Kemba's knee. Hayward is insurance if Kemba's not right. You know, he, he, he's, the, he's their he, best he ball shoot. distributor. Exactly. He can shoot. He can play, mate. You know, he, he's the guy that... Because, look, Tatum is a scorer. Brown is still developing as an offensive player. I think he's going to make the all-star team this year. I really do. He, there's a very good chance of that. But he's still not a, an outstanding offensive player. He's just he's merely very good. I mean, that's not a bad thing. But you know, Haywood is the guy that can stir the drink. He can be the straw that stirs the drink if Kemba's not there. I'm getting depressed but, more because I know this is true. Yeah, I'm not one of these fanboys <laughs> that's going to pretend, oh, my team's in it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look at yeah. Look, I can't look at this playing. off season and be like, yeah, I'm excited for the year. You, the the Celtics are still really really good, and you know they they obviously Ainge Stevens they're going to know the guys coming through more than you or I ever will. So I don't know maybe there is something to see from Edwards or Langford or something like that. I mean, I'd be surprised, but I actually am right. hopeful for the rookies they picked, and I know it's about it's a down draft. But I feel like in a draft like this, if you can get a guy like Neesmith that can hit, what do he shoot, 52% from three or something like that? If yeah, he shoots see, 40, I'm out. 40% from three? I'm out on Neesmith. Okay. Um, yeah. You can like, be right. It, I'm just, I'm just, I'm hopeful yeah. for the rookies they picked. Well, and look, it could go one way or the other with Neesmith. He, that last year of college was so far left field from his shooting numbers from the rest of his college career and going back to his high school days that it has fluke written all over it. Now he may have just improved that much, uh, but there will be some regression from those numbers. And yeah, I'm just hoping he shoots 40. He was average. (laughs) He was an average shooter. So if he can shoot 39, I'll be happy. Yeah. But if he ends up shooting 33, no, then I'm not happy. (laughs) Because without having his numbers in front of me, I think the season before, yeah, you know, his second last season at college, he shot like thirty-two percent from three, and that's the shorter line. 
So, you know, I, I don't know. I I think he was he should have been a first round pick, but I think he probably should have gone low to mid twenties. I think he was picked way too high. I do kind of like the Oregon kid too. Um, the Oregon kid, Pritchard. Oh yeah, no, Pete, yeah, he's he's a really good value pick. Yeah, he'll he'll play straight away, Peyton Pritchard. He's he's fine. I just it's so depressing. <laughs> there you go, Peyton Pritchard's the new Hayward. There it's so go. depressing. <laughs> like. Especially Kemba Walker, like it it drives me insane. I I know it's not you know the biggest deal in the world, but every time he shows up to a press conference, I don't want to see your New York Yankees hat. Stop doing it. Stop doing it. I think it's so disrespectful, especially because there was a question maybe like a day before. A reporter asked Brad Stevens, "Is this Jason Tatum's team now?" And he goes, "This is Boston's team." And the next day, Kemba Walker shows up in a New York Yankees hat. I, that doesn't sit well with me. Like Some Hatfield McCoy shit going on there. If you're gonna you're gonna do that, you better make the finals. You better be competitive. You better give us a championship. To do that, coming off the the sour taste of losing to a Miami team that wasn't ready yet, it just doesn't sit well with me. And I know he's not gonna play for a month now. I'm just depressed. <laughs> You know what? You sound like you're ready to call into Mike Franceca. <laughs> <laughs> you're just you're, you're easing yourself into it. It's good. Um, do, should we talk about some of the individual acquisitions, the good and bad? Real, real quick, do you think they can make yeah. the finals? Boston? Yeah. Well, they could. You know? um, Put it at on 1 to 10. Oh... Uh, Gee, I'd, I'd rate it maybe a, I'd rate him maybe a, a twenty five percent chance. I'd have the Bucks ahead of him. I'd probably have the Sixers ahead of him, and you'd have. Oh no, I'm ahead. not. I'm not with the Sixers. I, I like what they've got. They, You're they always on the much, Sixers train. <laughs> uh, they are looking much more like they did back when they yeah, had. Yeah, they look better though. Those sort of guys. So, um, and. I mean, you know, I, I will, I will stand and I will take all the punches for Brett Brown, but he is not as good a coach as Doc Rivers. Uh, I hate to say it because I love Brett Brown to my very core, but he is—he's just not as good as Doc. Yeah, I think they'll be better. Or that's the wrong word. I think the Sixers will be better, but I still think the Nets are the team. Oh, geez, I didn't even think people of it. Think yeah, I'm, no, you're right. The people Nets, think I'm nuts, but I, I just... No, you, you're absolutely right. And the way KD looked today, it, it looked like he'd never left. It, he, he looked so smooth. People think I'm nuts. I think it's going to work. As crazy as off fucking off the rails as Kyrie is, I think it's going to work. But the one... Look, Kevin Durant isn't exactly, you know a straight down the middle of the road dude either. That's what I'm he's, saying. He, I think it's all He's work. got his own idiosyncrasies <laughs> and they chose to be together. Now, this is the first time that Kyrie has chosen to be somewhere. He was drafted to Cleveland. He was traded to Boston. This is this is the first time in Kyrie's professional life that he has chosen where he wants I to be. I think he genuinely he likes and respects Durant, which I can't, I don't yeah. think I can say that about anybody else, but I think he actually does. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think they get along famously. And that will help. And, and the fact that they can complement each other as well. They can both play on the ball. They can both play off the ball as catch and shoot guys. Uh, and, you know, they've got an offensive genius sitting on that bench in D'Antoni. And they've got a guy who has all of the gravitas in the world. As much as he, we don't... I think Steve like Nash that. is going to be fine. Well, that's the thing. I, I think Nash... I, I honestly think Nash will will figure it out. He's a, He's a smart guy. He's a guy who understands relationships. Especially to have D'Antoni next to him, as he said. Well, that's the thing. That he can be his X's and O's fallback, you know. And D'Antoni and Nash know each other like the back of each other's hand too, which will, which will definitely help. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I should have put Brooklyn in that. Yeah, you know, you're right. That's, that's an oversight on my part. Uh, best and worst single acquisition. I know you're going to talk about it. What do you got? Yeah. Well, we've already spoken about Ibaka, so I won't sort of – go back over what we've spoken about. You think he's that important? I think that the the biggest positional weakness for the Clippers was center. You either went all offense or all defense. Ibaka gives them both. 
It's that simple. It basically means you can play two ends of the floor. I think their biggest price. problem is Lou Williams. Yeah, but I I think I think they will start to phase. Lou's thirty four years old. Yeah, you know, and like I said, he and Harold needed to be played together. You're sort of tethered one to the other, but without one, you can start to phase Lou out a little bit. You can drop him back to being a um, you know a, a fifth guard. You know, someone who comes on for maybe 12 or 13 minutes and if he catches fire, leave him out there for 22 and he might get you 30 points. But the games where his shot isn't falling and he's costing you a crap ton at the other end, you can yank him out quickly and put someone else in. You know, I actually think Terrence Mann could see similar sort of minutes. Terrence Mann's really good. I liked him out of Florida. I like both of those guys out of Florida State. Yeah, yeah. I think Mann should have played more last year. I, I think that was a... I don't think the Clippers have any picks left, but... I hope they can attach like a first round pick to Lou Williams to upgrade for like a Mate, real ball distributor. The next pick they can do is something like 2036 or something. Well, whatever, whatever they got to do to attach Lou Williams <laughs> to something, I think they need to do. Yeah. No, I, I think, I think you'd keep Lou around as long as Lou understands that, look, you're going to be, you know, dropping down that totem pole a little bit. And if he can subjugate himself to that, then I think you keep him around because he's the sort of guy that can win you a game in a quarter but that just doesn't happen as regularly as it did three years ago, four years ago. Um, I think Christian Wood is a really good signing. Let's sound the small sample size claxons here. Now, he started 15 games, but if you, like his 15 games as a starter, it's like 22 points, nine boards, a couple of threes, a couple of blocks and steals combined. Like it's all-star numbers. And yes, it's only 15 games, but... The sort of player that he is, is perfect to play alongside James Harden and to a lesser degree, Wall. Yeah, I can't, I can't get excited for that one. <laughs> I don't what? know why. Maybe, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I just – I don't know enough. Well, that, that's the thing. Like, he, he was cut from a G League team, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that, he, that was more an attitude thing. You know, he, but but I, here's I the thing. In college. What, what happens is he's got his money now. He, he had attitude problems before. He's he gets his money now. How do I know he doesn't revert back? Well, that's the sixty four thousand dollar question, and that's where I'm saying the small sample size. Yeah, you know, this is a guy who got cut from his Chinese league team, and he yeah. openly says that was when I hit rock bottom, and everything he's done from then has been really positive. So, the the optimist in me says he understands how lucky he is to get forty one over three years, which, by the way, is less than what the Pistons paid Jeremy Grant. Let's just put that out there. Um, considerably. Significantly. <laughs> Jeremy Grant. Um, but, yeah, if he continues on that path, he's going to be a very, very good player who fits that system perfectly. Frankly, he's the perfect centre for D'Antoni. <laughs> Probably just a year too late. But there is that, that part of me that says, okay, he, it's only been like this for 15 games. He was a good contributor off the bench. Is that his level? And as you said, does he get fat and lazy now that he's made his money? That's so there, what there is, Yeah, there, there's definitely little asterisks you can attach to Christian Wood. But Christian Wood fully realised is an excellent signing. I think I'll, I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say he will reach that. But I, I will completely acknowledge that there are red flags with him. Mm. Um, yeah, a sneaky little... Um, positive signing as well. And you know, you've worn your Homer hat. I'll wear mine now and talk about the Jazz. But bringing back Derek Favors is a sneaky, excellent signing. And I know, I know you're going to lambast me for this, but for 10 million a year, mate, it's whatever the money is, is what it is. It's <laughs> we're Utah. We're not saving money for LeBron James. Um, but if you look at Utah's on off, Utah were elite, absolutely elite in on-off numbers with Gobert on the floor with anyone. And as soon as he sat, you know, God bless Tony Bradley. You love but, that guy. No, I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, he's a, he's a, look, he's a good hard worker, but he's just limited. Utah created whenever Gobert was off the floor. Now, Favors will probably, and, and I, I certainly hope he doesn't come back and start as a four. I want him to ideally be the backup five who can spell go bear so that we're not putting so many miles into him. And it also gives Utah the ability to play big. 
if you looked at games against the two LA teams last year, or last season, this year, Utah just got eviscerated by the size of the Clippers and the Lakers. Now, Utah was starting, yes, Gobert's huge, but they're starting a six foot eight doughy wing at the four in uh, Bogdanovich. They're starting Ingles, who's six foot eight, but is, you know, built like a stick. And then you've got a pair of six foot one guards in the backcourt. Utah just couldn't get a damn shot up. So being able to play with a bit more size, both defensively and being able to pound it a little bit offensively, if they want to run with the two bigs, because Utah, it gives, it gives Quinn Snyder a lot more flexibility than what he had. He can play four out or he can play an old fashioned two, you know, two big lineup. And the big thing is, it means that Utah always has an excellent defensive anchor on the floor, which was their biggest Achilles heel last season. It, it, I want to talk about my biggest acquisition because I think it's a detraction. Okay. <laughs> If you can get a team to trade for Al Horford in this league, anything is possible. <laughs> I don't want to yeah. undersell how impossible it was to trade that Horford contract. But I can't Al- believe that that somebody actually took that contract. Horford just aged in dog years, and it's such. But a I knew it was because... coming. I saw it coming in Boston. I knew yeah. it was coming. No, to to your credit, you absolutely called it in that last season. With the, with the C's. Because he looked I, like that in the back half of the year with the Celtics. Yeah. So I, I thought he might have had a year, maybe two in him. But, yeah, he, he just completely fell off a cliff in Philly. It how did, wasn't the how right did Daryl right Morey move that contract and only gave up, what was it, one protected first-round pick, right? Because Daryl Morey is a That's warlock. unbelievable. He is a dead-set warlock, mate. If you gave him, like, half a dozen paper clips and Zaire Smith, he'll get you a late first-round pick for it. Yeah, he, he's incredible. He's a, I don't know how he does it, but he's a he's a fantastic general manager. He like either that or he's got the best PIs in the world getting incriminating photos of every other GM. Like, he, he just I don't seems know how he did it. Like, we can say what we want about Danny Green. He's not a, a world beater, but given what Horford gave him last year, mm. that's a significant upgrade to a team that really needed to shake things up. And I didn't even see how it was possible to move the contract. And but Green is ideal for the yeah. Sixers as well. Yeah, he's yet another long, you know, a, a long limbed, competent defender. And out, you know, in the regular season, was he right on forty percent from three? I think it was pretty close. And they to need that. shooters. That's yeah, absolutely. Ben Simmons needs shooters, and Danny Green isn't going to try and you know dance with the ball and take people off the dribble. He's there to defend his position, run around off screens, and catch and shoot, which is perfect. Ben Simmons absolutely perfect I think that, so, that that might be the the single biggest acquisition right there I don't know how I did it yeah it, it's a really it's it's one where the acquisition itself of Danny Green isn't huge and even getting off the Horford contract isn't huge in and of itself but when you combine all those little factors of that transaction it's pretty impressive yeah it's, it's really impressive um we spoke about Jeremy Grant as probably the the worst big signing of the offseason. I mean, you, you can name anybody the Pistons signed in free agency, though. Oh, look, whichever Plumley they signed, yeah. I, I forget which one. Um, Mitchell or Malcolm or something, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but whichever, like, that was an overpay as well. He's a good player, but look, he, he's a good backup. He's not a starter. Hey, he, he was, was once traded upon a time for Nurkic. Nurkic and a first round pick, <laughs> which is still mind boggling. Um, now, look on, on Jeremy Grant. Look, there is a there is a special place in basketball hell reserved for the guys who played one pretty good playoff series and parlayed it into you know, a, a, an absurd contract. You know, the the Jerome Jameses, the Jim McIlvains of the world. Jeremy Grant won't be as bad as those two, but. And I hate to say it because I really do like Jeremy Grant as a player. I just have the feeling this contract is going to age so ridiculously poorly. I agree. Um, I, agree. You, I, I do want to bring up one. one. Yeah. And it's not really a, like a bad signing. It's more of a bad decision. Sacramento, why would you not match that? <laughs> like, uh, I. What's Why would you not match that? Like You're telling me you can't trade Bogdanovich on that number? I get the feeling it might have been a case of, um, 
you know, maybe a favor for the agent or he said, look, oh, God. I'm not going to report. I'll go back to Europe or, you know, th there's all these different things it could be. The, the other side of it is they've clearly tried to trade Buddy Heald. Wouldn't. And if Heald's sitting there soaking it up and Bogdanovich is there soaking it up, neither of them are getting the minutes they want. Well, figure it maybe out. Maybe it's a chance to free up some cap space and, you know, get rid of a headache. Like, oh, to, to, to me, the Bogdanovich number is fine. Oh, no, it is. For a like, player of that caliber, it is. You got to get something for that. Be, yeah, they, they could have. They probably could have. But you know, he's got to want to be there. Yeah, if they if they decided, look, we don't need the... Yeah, remember, it's a new front office there as well. So they... And that front office just might not have been that big on him. But it might have just been a case of, look, we need to just start from scratch. We need to scorch earth some things. Let's just... Call up the Hawks and say, ways. we'll take say listen you guys can we'll give you bogdanovich send us a young guy like yeah if they, a little heat if they decided to pick up like deandre hunter or something yeah. that would have made it better. something yeah but look i i don't think it's indefensible i i think for sacramento like if sacramento were competing for something losing a guy they're never that competing that's the problem <laughs> but yeah but that's the thing even with bogdanovich they weren't so you know they're not really losing. It's not like they're losing the guy who's going to take them over the top. So, you know, it, it, it gives them that, it's more of a chance for Halliburton to play. It's uh, it's not ideal, but I don't think it's the worst decision in the world. You sound down on Buddy Heald. I actually kind of like him. He can shoot the lights out, but he yeah. does literally nothing else. And he may be 36 years old. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's uh, not bad, though. And it, it's a descending contract. It actually gets better as it goes. I yeah, think his last yeah. year is like sixteen million or something. Yeah, that might have been the best thing that Vlade did in his entire time there. Um, like the Celtics crazy. have a trade exception. I wouldn't mind if they used it on that guy. Like, what else are you going to get with a trade exception? You know what he he could he could probably help in Boston. To be quite frank, he is on a lot of money though. Yeah, just, I think the contract gets better as it goes. Which I like. It does. It does. But yeah, like that, that's probably not a bad shout. There's, I mean, look, every team could use more shooting. There's not a team in the league that wouldn't want an elite. Like Philadelphia, shooter. I think he would have fit great there. Oh, you, yeah, I suppose there's enough defensive players to be able to cover him. Um, yeah, every team wants more shooting, and he is an elite shooter. He just does literally nothing else. He, he's almost. Um, and hey, Duncan Robinson can make it work. Well, but he's, that's the thing. He's not as good as Robinson. He's not as good <laughs> as prime Kyle Korver. Uh, and look, Robinson and Kyle Korver are good team defenders as well. Heald's not even that. Um, is he, part of it Sacramento, player. though? Because he's had some problems there. Maybe you get the guy to buy in a little bit. It could quite well be, but, you know, it takes a while for that King's stank to come off. You know, it's, it's – after a few years, it gets pretty deeply ingrained in the skin. <laughs> Um, yeah, you wanted to, you know, as you wanted me to touch on and I guess tease the, the piece I'm going to do later this week about uh, the sleepers in the NBA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, got to, I've, I've still got to narrow the list down to about five or six, but there's quite a few that we could talk about. How much depth do you want me to go into here? Because I could go for an hour. <laughs> uh, give, give me a good tease, but go in depth on maybe one guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I touched a little bit on um, on Christian Wood. He's one that I look at as a as a as a sleeper of sorts because if he continues what he's doing, he's not really a sleeper. But um, Michael Porter Jr. is probably the obvious one. Everybody's talking about him as a sleeper after his playoff performances. Um, there's a few guys. Well, we spoke about Thomas Bryant before in the bubble, nineteen and nine. Uh, one one point four, one point six steal, something like that. A couple of blocks. He was hitting a little over two threes per game. Now with Westbrook coming in, with Beal coming back on board, with Bertans playing, he's not going to see the ball as much. But if he's somebody who can perhaps get you know, fourteen, fifteen points a game, get his eight rebounds. Yeah, you know, he's not going to defend well on switches. He's never going to be able to do that. He's just not fleet of foot enough. But if he can protect the rim well, those two blocks a game was unusual for him. If he can continue getting upwards of one and a half blocks a game and hit a couple of threes, that's that's going to be ideal 
for for that team. When you throw in the Tams, you know the the two big small forwards they've drafted in the last few years, Beal, they've got shooters everywhere. Troy Troy Brown Jr. looks really good off the bench as well. So he's somebody who needs driving lanes as well as Westbrook. So having a guy who's a legitimate stretch five that can protect the rim, if this rim protection and three point shooting is real, he could be a, a dead set sleeper. Um, Kobe White caught fire right before the shutdown. Uh, he obviously hasn't played since March, but those it was either his last three games or three of his last four games went for 33, 33 and 30, something like that. And it was just flamethrowers from threes. He's just launching it in people's faces. Um, a quiet one, I haven't got all of his stats here, but uh, DeAndre Ayton, I think, could be due another step. I was very down on him when the Suns drafted him, but and even after his rookie year, but once he came back from the suspension in the season just passed, he looked a different player. He looked really good defensively. He's always had tantalizing skills on offense. He's gonna and, he's gonna <laughs> that Chris Paul trade is gonna really help him too. That's exactly where I was going. If if Chris Paul's magic can rub off on DeAndre Ayton. I thought yeah. you were going to say DeAndre Jordan. <laughs> then anything's possible. <laughs> yeah, well, probably a bit late for that. Uh, but if, yeah, just whisper it, but is is Aiton, if he can go at like 22 and, say 22 and 11 with a couple of blocks, is he an outside shout for an all-star there? Probably. Uh, yeah. And, and that's the thing. Chris Paul could literally force this bloke into the all-star game if, if things go well for him. Um, there's a few other ones, you know, I guess lesser ones like you know, Chris Boucher and um, one. I like him a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, well, he's going to get some. He's going to get force-fed minutes. Now, he was the third-string center. The top two have gone. Aaron Baines is in there, and, and you know, I love Aaron Baines, but he's 34 years old and injury-prone. He's, he's going to be a great player for Aaron Baines. He's going to fit him really well. But you can almost, especially in this compacted season you can almost certainly pencil in that Baines is going to miss 20 games. So Boucher, he showed in limited minutes some really good stuff last season. He's going to need to do it over the whole season in a bigger role as the primary backup. But there's going to be a lot of games where he's going to have to play 35-plus minutes. So it'll be interesting to see how he holds up. Um, also, just physically how he holds up. He's, a, he's such a slight guy. He, How will he go banging bodies in a tight schedule for 20 minutes a game and then having to ramp it up every now and again when Bain sits. I, I, it's an intriguing little little case study that, that Boucher will be this season. Yeah, he was a guy I really liked at Oregon. Then he tore his knee up, and then people sort of forgot about him. Yeah, yeah. No, I think he's I think he's going to be very handy. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm just I'm not convinced he can hold up for a whole season in this compacted season. But he's, he's certainly going to get every chance to show that he's a legitimate NBA player. I think, um, you, I think you left this off the list of topics unless you have any other players you want to talk about. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I, w- I won't take too many out of the piece I'm going to write. So. Give me one team that you like more than maybe the public does and one team that you think is way worse than the public does. Mm, okay. Um, oh, this is a... I I honestly think that Toronto, you know, Toronto are going to fall away in a in a big way. I, I really do. Kyle Lowry is like you'd never bet against Kyle Lowry, but he has to age at some point. Surely, he has to age. They're missing Marcus O. Um, yeah, they're missing Ibaka, Ananobi. Can step up, but will he? Now, is he quite ready to be like a second option on offense, perhaps? And Pascal Siakam is, you know, we saw it in the playoffs. You and I mm. on the last spot spoke about the Siakam Brown conundrum. Uh. And it, no, no, I still think that if they swapped, they'd be pretty much, <laughs> they, they would replicate what the other does. Okay. Brown is a guy who is not ready to be a first option on offense, but he's an excellent defensive player and great as a third option. I think Siakam's the same. But unfortunately, he's miscast as the main offensive option. 
that works fine in a regular season. But when teams can plan for you in a playoff setting, he has shown to come up short. He's still ideally a third option, possibly a good second one. But for a side that has conference finals aspirations, if he's your main guy on offense, you're probably going to struggle. So I, I do think that Toronto, there's growth left in Siakam. Um, but I was surprised when I, when I looked this up that he's already 27 years old. Yeah. I thought he was like 24, 25. He's older than I thought. So there is going to be growth in him, but probably not as much as everyone anticipates. So this version of Siakam might be what we have. And Toronto will need to get an alpha on offense to make that team tick. And, and I don't see it happening. This is maybe a dumb side tangent, but you've brought this up a couple times. I think losing Marcus All is a great thing. I begged Toronto to play him in the playoff series every time. I loved when that guy was on the floor. I don't think he has anything left. Like nothing. Offensively, not much. Like he's still a gifted passer. But yeah, defensively, but... He, he is such a good organizer of a defense. And that can't be underrated. He calls out everything that's happening. It's similar to how Bogut was in his late years with the Warriors. He could barely move. Like you know, he moved in installments. Bogut. It's bad. But yeah, yeah. He, Watching he's, Gasol out there, is, it's it's tough. Oh yeah, no, he, he's his legs are shot just like Bogut's was. But what they do is that they are always in the right position, even if they can't make the play, they'll at least halt the play, and they make sure that everybody else knows. He's got to stop on. shooting. Can't be underrated. He's got to stop shooting. Oh yeah, no. Offensively, <laughs> he's done. Outside of his passing, which is still genius level, um, he is done. He's not a scorer anymore. Um, but that, and that's where losing, losing him by himself isn't a bad thing, but losing he and Ibaka hurts Toronto. Yeah. That's the one. yeah. So if you, and even if you lose Ibaka, you know, you still have Gasol, you bring in Baines, you've still got, you know, three good centers there all veteran or two veterans, but yeah, it, losing both of them will hurt. Baines is good, but he's not as good defensively, um, He's a better shooter than either Ibaka or uh, Gasol, but he doesn't do anything else as well as them. And, and yeah. I think Toronto yeah. will drop away. The team that I think will step up even more is Dallas. Now, where, where do they finish? Seven, six, seven, something like that? Yeah. Who did they play in the first round? I can't recall. Clippers. They played the Clippers in the first okay, round. Okay, so they finished um, – they would have finished seventh then. Yeah. Yeah. That's so my pick. We get another full season of Luca. We hopefully get um, Porzingis healthy for a full season. They will miss Seth Curry shooting, but Josh Richardson is an immense pickup for that team. He could be an absolute steal for the Mavericks. He, you know, That team absolutely floundered when Luca was on the bench because they didn't have another playmaker. They were relying on Trey Burke, for God's sake. And you know, he showed flashes, but he's still Trey Burke. Tim Hardaway can shoot, but you know, he can't he, he can't dribble. <laughs> he's not going to create for anyone. And he's not exactly a, a lockdown defensive player either. In in uh, Richardson, they get a guy who can shoot just about as well. If you ignore the year in Philly when nothing worked for anyone, going back to his Miami days, he shoots pretty much as well as Hardaway. He's by far the better defender and by far the better creative player. He could be that secondary playmaker to take the pressure off Luca. So that is it, you remember last season, uh, Dallas's crunch time stats were absolutely deplorable, and a lot of that was put down to Luca just being exhausted because he had to do everything on offense. Having a guy like Richardson who can give him a spell for two or three minutes, or even a spell within a play, you know, he can drive and kick, and then drift to the corner and knowing somebody else can run a secondary action, that might be enough just to save Luca's legs for those last few minutes. If that gets Dallas another four or five wins over the course of a, a season, suddenly they're looking at a top three bit. I don't even have to say anything else. This is my team for the topic. It's like yeah. when, I, when I look at the Mavericks, all right, they were a seven seed and I think people are kind of just down on them for whatever mm. reason. But to me, this is the year. The Mavericks are a top three seed. They bring in Richardson. I love that pickup. Mm. And even, yes, losing Seth Curry hurts. 
what happens if the Stanford kid they picked in the second round can play? I almost mm. feel he, like he can fill that role. So I don't, I don't know if they really even lose anything there. They do because they, they do, but... might. Yeah, because he might be the best shooter in the league. Yeah, but... Yeah, as, as far as a standstill catch and shoot guy, he might be the best in the league. When you're adding Is Richardson right? and that guy, I think yeah. it kind of puts well, Dallas there's... over the top. There's enough shooting there that you can compensate for losing Seth Curry. And it's not like Richardson is... Um, and Lucas you know, should keep getting better. Like, Yeah, he's 21. <laughs> and, and look, Richardson might not be the shooter Seth Curry is, but it's not like you're bringing in Rondé Hollis-Jefferson. Yeah, he can, he can shoot the ball really well. But there's one thing I forgot to mention. Dallas kind of fell in a bit of a hole once Dwight Powell went down, once they lost their rim runner. Yeah, Maxi Kleber is a good pick and pop guy. Porzingis is obviously only a pick and pop guy, as much as he's elite at it. But um, they'll get Dwight Powell back at some point this season, and they get a full preseason with another excellent rim runner in Willie Cauley Stein. So I don't even have to say uh, anything. <laughs> so is, is you see, Luca, you've, you've taken everything. Yeah. No, well, yeah. I mean, Luca loves his loves his role to the basket guys. He's great at finding guys on the on the the kick out but he's excellent at those pocket passes and Powell is wonderful at that Willie Cauley Stein at his best is is good at that whether he's yeah, you know, we talked about the Sacramento stank whether he's managed to scrap that off yet I don't know but those two guys could thrive with Luca. yeah my my prediction is Dallas is a top three seed they really build momentum and they get a big fish in the 2021 class Giannis I don't know it's who it is. About. It's been talked about. I don't know who it is, but they have a max spot. It's the only time they'll ever have a max spot with Luca. Somebody's going to want to play with him. Oh, man. Could you imagine? Oh, could you imagine the fever dreams Rick Carlisle would be having? Is he, is and he's it's, able to put, it's no like, state income tax, especially in a year that oh, we've Texas, had. Oh, Texas, of course. Yeah. In a year that we've had. Yeah. And I'm sure these guys are doing fine. But maybe it starts to. <laughs> Maybe it starts to like, oh, hey, you know, maybe we should consider this a little bit more. Man, I, can you the, imagine, you know, Porzingis if, standing outside on the wing for the kick out off a of Luka Giannis <laughs> pick and roll? Like, if I'm a Max guy, that's where I would want to go. Yep. Where would you want to go? Josh I, would, I would choose them over Miami. The corners. Wow. <laughs> that team, like, that team might might never, ever miss a shot. <laughs> just be absurd i'm, I'm super <laughs> high on dallas yeah. no so am i i think they're going to be a lot better than last season i, I i'm i'm re- and the other thing is rick carlisle's a genius yeah he's really he good find a way to make things work that's just what he does he always makes teams better i do want to bring up because i didn't mention my team for a team that people i'm not quite as high on the bucks hmm. i think there's a chance they got worse and it, it's Yes, Holiday's an upgrade over Bledsoe. Mm. I'm not quite sure it's a major upgrade. And I think they've lost things. Wes Matthews was weirdly important. They lose George one Hill. of George, George Hill, weirdly important. Mm. And Robin Lopez. Correct yeah, me if I'm wrong, but did they play too much? Did they play too much? Did they find a backup center? They've gone, yeah, they and they've kind of gone away from the all defense and, you know, just shooting around Giannis thing um, by getting Bobby Portis, who doesn't play defense and doesn't make shots. Are we sure Um, he's as good as Lopez though? Oh God, no, no, he's nowhere near. So that's what I'm saying. We can Hmm. say holiday is better than Bledsoe, but I think when we're adding Hill and West Matthews and Lopez, it starts to get really close. Oh, they're very thin. I mean, Jordan Nawara, the rookie, he's going to play. Whether he's ready or not, he's going to play. And, and look, I think I think he's pretty handy. In the world. DJ Augustine, great. they paid how much money to? Are we like DJ? Look, <laughs> DJ's fine. I've got no problem when, with. DJ. When we're adding all these things up, I'm just. Mm-hmm. No, Milwaukee was awesome last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just it's ran into be, the one team that is tailor made to take them out in in Miami. It's going to be tough to repeat that win total, whether they're oh, better or not. <laughs> It is. But the other thing we've got to consider is that they did that win total with nobody playing more than Giannis's 31 minutes a game. They have room to grow within the team. They're a lot thinner than they were last season, but that might play to their advantage because they simply have to play their best players. 
I'm worried about their depth. Oh, yeah. No, they're, they're much thinner than last season. They were exceptionally deep last year. They're not completely shallow, but they're, they're just average depth now. They're, they're really not... And, and, you know, in a normal season, that might not matter, particularly in the playoffs. But this season, when we're dealing with the compact schedule, uh, the... And the you said it last year, they, those guys didn't play that long. Like, no. They were rested. They were ready to go yeah. every day. Yep. But this season... You know, the, the compact schedule, the lack of a preseason, the, you know, there's going to be injuries that come from that compact schedule. There's also the fact that teams will lose players because of COVID for weeks on end. So that depth is probably more important this season. I'm worried about Milwaukee. I think yeah. they could lose 10 wins. They could. Um, but wouldn't that still leave them a top two seed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just saying, I think, I think Milwaukee's like – I'm, I'm really they're worried about They're not as strong them. as they were last season. The, 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 only, um, the only silver lining is that, like I said, that lack of depth might mean they play their best players more, which evens it out a little bit. Uh, yeah, assuming there's no injuries or anything. You know, all other things being equal. Um, but it's Budenholzer. He might, you know, he, he can be stubborn. He might decide that I'm only going to play Giannis 32 minutes a game. I'm only going to play Brook Lopez 26 minutes a game and suddenly we're seeing you know eight or nine minute stretches of you know bobby portis and dj wilson which no one wants to see uh, uh. No. <laughs> uh i guess the only other things we have left is i think we kind of covered everybody but maybe your finals pick or conference finals picks yeah i've got no idea <laughs> this is you, like, I've usually got a good idea who I'm backing in to at least make the, the final four prior to a season but Trey I've got no idea this year man this this could go in so many ways LeBron could play 45 games this season you know we could see seeding going all over the shop with co- like you know durable guys who you know, iron men who never miss games could miss half a season with COVID will come back and they're not quite themselves. Yeah. Oh, this, this is like blindfolding yourself. Hey, the vaccine is coming. Don't worry. Don't worry. The, the vaccine <laughs> Look, will be here I, yesterday. I, I genuinely hope that <laughs> all of that works out. Um, Cause again, I like, you know, Australia's got this colloquial term, the lucky country, but we are exceptionally fortunate over here with what has happened with COVID. Even our, relatively big outbreaks, you know, led to seven or 800 deaths. Whereas, you know, you guys are getting how many thousands a day. Um, yeah, it, it's, I, I honestly hope, and I'm, I'm getting off basketball and getting quite serious for a moment, but I, I genuinely hope that, you know, whatever vaccines come through, that they work, they get distributed to the right people. And, and to be honest, the right people aren't NBA athletes. You know, the, the right people, look, my wife's a nurse. The right people yeah. are frontline health professionals. They're, I was uh, I, I was joking the players. other day. I, I, I hope the entire fan base of the Buffalo Bills gets it first so they can be back in the stands. <laughs> 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 Nothing quite right, like the now, Buffalo Bill fans. Now, here's a good one. Which <laughs> fan base would you not want to get it? Which one comes in 30th? <laughs> let's, let's see what fan base we can piss off at the end of this podcast. Oh, that's a good question. Huh. So go to go to Vendetta's Twitter page, and we'll have a poll. Up at the end of this <laughs> I'm trying to think of a really obnoxious fan base. Probably the Lakers. <laughs> um, see, I know a lot of people would say Utah's fan base, yeah. um, or even or like. Utah, Portland, the, the one the one team cities, they are nuts. Let, let's face it, they're, 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 all their focus is on this one thing. So they tend to be a bit over the top with it all. But yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'm just be happy to see people back in the stands for basketball. To see basketball that's not in a ballroom. Yeah, in um, in English soccer this last weekend, they had fans back in the stadium for the first time, and it it made such a difference to the game. There was energy to the game that wasn't there beforehand. The, you know, Gavin's probably a, a good one to speak to about this, but 
having fans back in the stands, having your own stadiums, it makes a huge difference to the players, whether they realise it or not. Yeah. So yeah. I'll I'll just be happy that people are back in the stands and that you know, it might be two or three thousand in a stadium, but as long as they're back, everyone's healthy, everyone's safe, and we get a full season of basketball and some sort of return to normal life. You know, that's they're the big things. Ultimately, basketball is probably at the lowest rung of those priorities. But as a basketball guy, it's something I want to see. My pick's Brooklyn. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Gave you enough time. Monologues for long enough to let you think. Um, I think Brooklyn, well, Brooklyn, I think it's going to work. Yeah, hopefully it does. I, I mean, I genuinely hope it does. It's catastrophic if it doesn't. So we've all got to cross fingers, toes, whatever. The to craziest thing is... Ways. They're so deep. They're so deep. I don't think people realize how many guys they got. Oh, Brooklyn. Yeah. Well, that's a shame. Andrew Shamit's like their 10th guy. Assuming they don't trade half of them for James yeah. Harden. They got a ton of guys. Yeah. I mean, even a, a pickup like Bruce Brown. Like, mm. Yeah, he's handy. He did a right for Detroit. They got a lot of guys. Tori, Tori and Prince can play. Dinwiddie can play. Lavert can play. Joe Harris can play. Jared Allen can play. They just got a lot of dudes, even beyond yeah, the Harris two stars. Joe Harris is genuinely good. He, he's <laughs> a very good basketballer. Um, yeah, now Brooklyn's – does any other team have that sort of depth? Probably only the Clippers, really. It's crazy to think about, given the fact that how they've recovered after the – Durant and Paul Pierce, or not Durant, uh, Garnett and Paul Pierce. Trip. Yeah. Oh, and look, even going back further than that, Darren Williams. <laughs> that tried to exactly work out either. I think his money came off the books like <laughs> just like a year ago or something. Yeah, that, that gives me an idea for a piece. I might see um, <laughs> what bad stretched contracts are still out there. Josh Smith has surely got to be still in Detroit's books. I think he just came off too oh. this year. That was going to be the selling piece of the story. Bugger. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look into that one. Yeah. Um, that is a good yeah, idea, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I might have a look into that. But look, getting back to your question, I've got no idea who's going to make these finals. I, I genuinely have no idea. There's like There are just so many variables that are in play that it's impossible to make a pick. I don't and think Miami's going to go back to the finals. Well, I don't necessarily think so. I wrote a piece not long after the finals saying, was their run a fluke? I mean, they're genuinely a very, very good side, but are they are they in the top three in the East? I think they really benefited from that bubble. Yeah. I don't know what did. it was, but I, I, they just seemed more dialed in than everybody else. It's that heat culture, I reckon. Yeah. You know, it's the most militaristic culture within the NBA. It felt like so it being, mattered more in the bubble than it would any other year. Yeah. Well, being away from the families when, you know, that that's a very militaristic thing. And I honestly think the Heat's culture was tailor-made for that situation. So they're going to lose that little bit of a, an unexpected inbuilt advantage. Um, yeah. Everybody's back into normal life now. People like Paul George quite openly said how much he struggled with bubble life. Whereas you know, Jimmy Butler's sitting up coffee shops. He, can, yeah. he, he just adapted like that, you know. And he can live in a car. He don't care. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think the Heat, the Heat benefited from playing in the bubble, definitely. I, I don't think the Heat – I'd put I'd put Milwaukee, Brooklyn, Philly, possibly even Boston ahead of them. I almost agree. You almost agree? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm just so depressed about the Celtics. <laughs> like, I, I, up, I do want to say that they're better, but after seeing what yeah. they did. Ugh. Look, those two teams are the four or five for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I honestly, I, th I, don't think I think you're too high in Philadelphia in too. Yeah. There is an element if we need to see it, but this team looks a lot like the one that Toronto knocked out in the way to the championship. Yeah. And that, that, that with better coaching fills me with a bit more confidence in. Um, but look, it's Philadelphia. You know, they, they could miss the playoffs and nobody, nobody would be all that shocked either. Is there any if chance the Lakers don't, don't repeat? Team. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, AD, what could go wrong for them? Well, AD was injury prone for a long time. You know, 
in a shortened, condensed season, one where LeBron sits a lot, he's going to take on a lot of the load. What happens? And if they played the longest. Too. Yeah, exactly. They've had the shortest break, and Le- LeBron may or may not be a cyborg, but there's got to be a point where he starts to slow down. Sure. Um, you know, Markeith Morris is he prepared to be a good soldier two years in a row? Dennis Schroeder is he prepared to be a good soldier two years in a row? Um, they they probably maxed out what uh, Alex Caruso can do. Okay. Probably maxed out what KCP can do. I'm, oh well, I shouldn't say that about Caruso in his you know inevitable Hall of Fame career. Um, you know, Kyle Kuzma is what he is. You know, he's a guy who can light you up, but only sometimes. They're not. Yeah, I don't know. They're just. Yeah, and they've picked up Marcus Gasol, but as we mentioned, he's a thousand years old. He's still a very good organizer of a defense, but that probably means less on a veteran team with really good defenders like LeBron and AD than it does on a team like Toronto, where he had to do direct Siakam and Ananobi and Norm Powell around. You know, his particular skill set on defense probably doesn't have the same impact that it, that it did as, as a Raptor. I just hope the Clippers beat him. I, I want I want them to show some fight, not roll over again. I I just want to see a Clippers championship. Is if that happens, anything's possible. See my my football team over here, the the Melbourne Demons. We won our last flag, our last premiership in 1964. The at the time we had more premierships than any other club. And we literally have not won one for over 50 years. My soccer team, Everton, we haven't won a league championship since 1980. I want to say 87. It might have been 86, but I think it was 87. And at the time, we had the second most amount of championships in English football, in soccer. We've won jack shit since. So if the Clippers can win, then the other teams I can support have life. And where there's, you know, they have hope. And at the moment, (laughs) you know, uh, like I figure, look, if the Clippers can do it, nothing is impossible. All right. Uh, right. I think that's a good place to end. (laughs) Uh, Jared, do you have anything else to bring up? I think we have covered everything and then some, Trey. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Make sure to follow Jared again. Hey, underscore, hey, underscore JP. It's JP. It's JP. Almost got you know, it. I might change it again and make it easier for you to say. <laughs> uh, follow us on Twitter, media underscore vendetta. Subscribe on YouTube. Of course, all of our podcasts are video and audio. Uh, other than that, buy a shirt if you can't. J- Jared, let's see it real quick. Yeah, he's got it. Uh, use the coupon code CHEESE, 20% off your orders. Other than that, thank you guys for watching, and we will see you next time.